so good to be with everyone today. Great to be here in Michigan. And uh, in the early service, we heard the rain overhead, you know, coming down. And, uh, and I was pleased with that because my, my message today is going to talk a little bit about rain. Uh, when I was a kid, my mother was a school teacher. And, you know, school teachers, they look for teachable moments. And uh, we lived in South Carolina. And in South Carolina, they have these things called thunderstorms. I mean, I know you get them here, but I mean, these are, they're just huge. You feel like the, the earth is going to shake apart. And uh, my mom, whenever the thunderstorms would begin, she would often say, now, boys, sit down. And we would sit with her on the couch. We were like 10, 12 years old. And she would turn the lights out. And she would say, do you boys know how powerful God is? And then, boom, this big, you know, thunderclap would hit. And she's like, he made the heavens and the earth. And then, boom, the lightning would flash. And I could swear my mother and God were in cahoots. You know, that he was given, like, the special effects for my mom. Like the, you know, she was the, the movie producer. And, you know, he was back there doing all this stuff. But it impressed me. You know, the scripture does tell us to impress the word of God upon our children. Uh, and that impressed me. So we heard some rain this morning. Uh, and there are seasons of life that we go through struggles. We go through challenges. Uh, Emerge Ministries is very related to that. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it in a minute. But before I do, I want to say for Pamela, Rob, and me, we are so blessed to be here. Uh, we've loved the family reunion, loved to celebrate uh, the birthday of a patriarch in our family, uh, the family Abraham, and your tribe is growing, and, uh, and just so grateful. Not only is uh, Papa Chris, my father-in-law, he's been a true mentor to me in ministry. Uh, Pamela was raised in ministry. I was not. So uh, they, they gifted me with her and many gifts that come along with her. Uh, that have been a great help to me in ministry. Uh, but I also want to say to Pastor Jeff and Tammy, uh, to Steve and David and Luke, uh, how much we love you and appreciate being able to be here. Um, you know, the, 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 over the years, they have all been so encouraging and supportive in so, so many ways. And uh, we are privileged and honored to be here this morning. Uh, also to have Phil and Becky here. We have ministered in their church, and we were, we were supposed to do a marriage retreat in May, and then this whole COVID thing hit, so we're looking forward to that. Love you guys. They put on an incredible day of fun for us just the other day, so it was wonderful. Well, Emerge will turn, actually turn 50 years old in about two years, and it started with a pastor in Akron at an Assemblies of God church. His wife became clinically depressed you know, depression is like that hole that you find yourself in. You keep trying to climb out of it, but it's like there's oil or grease on the walls and you keep slipping back down. It doesn't necessarily mean that you want to harm yourself. Sometimes it does. But sometimes it's you want to close your eyes and not have to wake up because life has just become so hard. Life has become so difficult. Well, this pastor's wife became clinically depressed. And in the midst of that depression, he eventually encouraged her to go to a Christian counselor 47, 50 years ago, a little bit more than that for him. And she went and one said, you know, I know what you need to do. You need to read your Bible more. Another one said, you just need to pray more. You need to pray more. And this, uh, this pastor, Richard Dobbins, said to the, the counselor, you don't understand. There's nobody I know that prays more and reads their Bible more than my wife. She prays all the time. She reads the Bible all the time, but she is still depressed. So he went from one Christian counselor to another, and he finally began to wonder, are there no Christian counselors that are learning how to take the Word of God and what we've learned about psychology and what we've learned about the brain and the leading of the Holy Spirit and weaving those together to help people become whole? So he became so frustrated. You know what he did? He, he signed up for a Ph.D. program at the University of Akron, and he became the first Ph.D. in psychology at the University of Akron. And then, little by little, he began to counsel more. Uh, how many of you have ever, have you ever picked up that sometimes there's a stigma attached to counseling? You know, 
It's like, oh, oh, they're going to counseling. Oh, I've heard they're going to counseling. And I want to say smart people. You know, if you get a new job, you want to get trained for that job. If you get married, you need a bit of premarital what? Counseling. To live life, to imagine living life with all the ups and downs of life without counsel. We all need counsel. And in some ways, we may find it in traditional ways and non-traditional ways. But the nature of God is that he's a counselor. Jesus is referred to as the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. You know, Eugene Peterson in the, um, in the message uh, translates wonderful counselor as the prince of wholeness. The prince of wholeness. You see, wholeness has a lot to do with holiness because God is whole. He's complete. He's perfect. He doesn't need anyone or anything to exist. And the Bible describes him as a perpetual, powerful source of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. Jesus would often say things like, you know, you haven't asked for anything in my name. Ask. You'll receive. Your joy will be full. Jesus wanted the people around him to be full of joy. And he wants you and me to experience it. Not a fake, put on, pretend. But I love what Pastor Jeff said. We need a revival of transparency. A real joy. Um, what's the thing we say to one another so often when we walk by? Hey, how's it going? Oh, great. You know, we keep going. And we say it all the time. How you doing? Great. Good. Every now and then you'll hear somebody at church or at a grocery store, wherever you bump into them, and they'll say, good. And you'll think, wait a minute. And you... It helps in that moment to step up and say, no, how are you really doing? And that gives them permission to be honest with you. And it probably that one little tweak opens up an opportunity for you to minister. Well, Emerge Counseling Ministries uh, has done somewhere around a quarter of a million hours of counseling over the years, our team and clinicians. Uh, thousands of pastors have been counseled, equipped through soul care ministries. Uh, you know, we need our shepherds strong to help keep the churches strong, amen? The scripture says, strike the shepherd and the sheep scatter. So Emerge believes, bless the shepherd and the sheep will be blessed. Encourage and make sure, because a lot of times pastors get so busy, they're helping other people. And somebody years ago said, the problem with the shoe cobbler is that his kids have holes in their shoes. You know, because we're so used to helping people, then we get home and we're worn out and we might not take that extra time. So keeping pastors replenished is important. But we do a lot more than that. Uh, last year, we served about 1,000 children uh, in various counseling needs. Uh, we partner with churches uh, and ministries all over the 50 states. And in 1996, if, if uh, you could talk to one of the 38,000 ordained and licensed ministers in the Assemblies of God, and they pulled their credential card out. On the back of it is a 1-800 number that was started in 1996. And when they call, they don't get Springfield, Missouri. They get a counselor in Akron, Ohio, one of our counselors, whatever it is they're going through, whatever they need to talk about, whatever is weighing on their mind or heart, they can call and they get a licensed clinician for whatever time they need to talk about what they're going through. And we will often direct them to counseling, to come to Emerge. Some people come to Emerge to get marriage counseling. A lot of people from Michigan come down. A lot of people from Canada. We have people from Canada all the time that come to do a yearly marriage uh, recharge, a marriage tune-up in their life. You know, why wait until you desperately need counseling to get counseling? If you have a good marriage, why not shoot for a great marriage? So Emerge does a lot of different types of ministry, individual counseling, marriage counseling, family counseling, trauma counseling. Uh, in February, we took a team of clinicians to West Florida that you remember about 17 months ago was hit by Hurricane Michael. And I mean, you talk about devastating a part of the country. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Just miles and miles of land and buildings that are completely destroyed. Uh, trees and forests that are all twisted up. Well, now there are pastors and their families that are dealing with the residue. Some have lost 50% of their congregation. 
uh, several, about 10%, totally lost their building, uh, meeting in all kinds of different places. So we went, and when we were there, we were there about 15 months after Hurricane Michael hit, and we, and we just had counseling session one after another uh, for marriage, for depression, for challenges they were facing. One of the pastors I talked to us, and I'm concerned that maybe we're here a little too late. He said, oh, no, no. He said, if you were here right when it hit, we would not have been ready. But he said, all that we've gone through has brought out a lot of other issues in our lives. We believe at Emerge that what has hit America in the, in the world in the last few months, that the traumatic results of it are going to be impacting this country for months to come. We don't all have it figured out. No one does. And, when it, you know, the people that I think look the most foolish today are the ones that act like they have it all figured out because we don't have it all figured out. This is a, one of the senses of time when we feel a little bit out of control, and we need God. Amen? We need his wisdom. We need his help. And at Emerge, our theme is really find rest and live free. Jesus wants you to find rest and to live free. And I encourage you to take a look at our website, emerge.org. There are videos, uh, articles, blog posts, all kinds of tools to help you with your own soul. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life to the what? Full, the full life, the abundant life. He wants you to be joyful. You know, even, uh, even when you're struggling, God wants us to have joy. Joy is like the, is the edge of the Christian life, to be joyful, even in tribulation, even in struggle, to learn how to work on our joy. So one of the latest projects we're working on that you could pray with us about is a national referral list and a national telecounseling network. We believe that the Lord, and Pamela and I never imagined two years ago that we would be leading a national counseling ministry, and we certainly never imagined to step into that and then have COVID hit this nation. Never expected it. So we believe that the Lord has raised up Emerge for such a time as this. So through COVID, a lot of churches have done more digital, Emerge has done more digital. We've gone from about 5% telecounseling to 70% telecounseling. And we've grown. During the COVID season, we've hired three new people on our team. And uh, we pressed into the need. But we feel the Lord has challenged us to build a national network of Christian telecounselors that could be accessed anywhere in the United States. We're adding one state at a time. Every time we add a clinician in a new state, the whole state will light up for telecounseling. We have just stepped into Pennsylvania, just hired someone there. So pray with us. And as a part of it, we have asked the Lord to give us 70 people, individuals, organizations that would give 10, 25, or $50,000 towards the building of that national network and all that goes into it as well. So pray with us about that. Uh, we feel like we have to get ourselves in the places where there are people in need. In the book of Exodus, the Bible says that the Lord heard the cries of the Hebrew slaves and he raised up Moses to help bring them to freedom. And we believe that the Lord hears the cries of people that have lost jobs, people that have lost loved ones, people that are confused about the future. And we feel a deep sense of responsibility to raise up counselors to respond to the need. I talked earlier about depression, and there are a lot of emerged stories, and one of them I want to show you today of uh, one of the most capable people that I've ever met who uh, is very skilled in, in coaching and leading other people. But he hit a point in his life where he dealt with depression. Uh, his name is Daniel. You'd watch his story, please. I grew up kind of a lonely person. And a lot of people would have thought I was happy and things were going well. And I wanted everybody to think that. But I would find myself um, just getting really dark. And I didn't know at the time that I was depressed. Well, I, I grew up in a ministry home and uh, loved my family, my family loved me. But uh, we, there were a number of factors that, that kind of produced um, some pain in me. Uh, I, uh, my mom uh, struggled with mental illness and my sister kind of became my mother. She was about 12 years older than me. So then she moved away when she grew up and, and it, I felt abandoned. So I, I kind of isolated myself from pretty much everybody. Um, 
because of that pain. And got into adulthood, tried to ignore all this stuff, met my wife, realized that I was, I was having difficulty um, connecting, in a sense, with her. Everything kind of came to a head. It was under tremendous amount of pressure. Um, I knew I wasn't doing well. Somehow, I couldn't pull myself out. And I found myself one day at work, unable to do normal uh, activities. That uh, brought me to a point where I just said, I need to get some help. And Emerge it came immediately to my mind because of the connection with the Assemblies of God. And I knew about Emerge, but I kind of thought I would never go. In my family culture, it was embarrassing to think that I might need some help. And so I put it off and put it off and put it off for years. And so I had a friend uh, who had gone to Emerge, and I had no idea. And he said, uh, you know, I went to Emerge, and it was really helpful for me. You ought to consider it. And I was kind of shocked. I said, you went to Emerge? And then he told me his story a little bit, and it gave me the confidence to just go ahead and go. And I had a, a series of experiences with God which surprised me. I got to the point with my counselor where he said, I said to him, what else can I do? And there was a kind of a silence and he said, I, I've done what I can do now. And I said, yeah, but what can I do? And he said, you've really done what you can do as well. And I said, so that's it? And he said, well, I really believe that the Holy Spirit will speak to you. The Lord will speak to you in the right time. He'll show you what he needs to show you. And there's just, there's ex something with the Lord that you are gonna be experiencing. That yeah, will happen over time, I guess. I don't know when. And I got kind of mad, honestly. I said, so I've been working my tail off. You're doing the best you can. And you're telling me you can't do anything? I can't do anything? And he said, yeah. And so I thanked him, we prayed together, and we ended that session. I was walking out in the parking lot on the way to my car. I was mad. And I said, so that's it. I'm not going to try to get healthy anymore. I've done the best I can. The counselor's done the best he can. I'm done. Because I was, I just thought I'd... And I heard... Um, the sweet the voice of God. I've been waiting. You know. And um, I've been waiting for this. So you'd realize that your healing, your health can come from me. Not from you and not from your effort, not from you trying to figure it out. The counselor helped. You know, I worked hard, and uh, but it was really the healing was going to come from God. I thought how weird it was. Here I, you know, I still am not different. I just sensed that God was with me. The Lord spoke to me, and He, I just said, uh, I created you because I wanted somebody like you to love. The heart of Emerge is really the work of the Holy Spirit. Because there are a lot of counselors and organizations that will counsel you, will bring you uh, insight, will help you understand what you're walking through. Uh, but over the years, it's been that combination of the work of the Spirit amidst all of it. And Pamela and I, in the last year, have heard story after story like this, uh, young and old, where God is using counseling and the work of the Spirit in it to set people free. And he whom the Son sets free will be what? Free? Indeed, and that's what God calls us to and he brings us to. And that's really right at the heart and the purpose of counseling and Christian counseling. Uh, some of you that might be listening today and you say, you know, there have been times in my life that I've thought about getting counseling. And today I appreciate that my pastor earlier has said, you know, take that step. So many people do. And if that's something will, that will be helpful to you, take that step. We have people, as I sh shared, that come from all over the country 
uh, many of them discover as they do that their insurance even covers a lot of the cost, if not all of it, for that. So we're here and we would ask you to pray with us as we endeavor to reach out to more people and to serve their needs, especially as we go through the season. Counseling is like a shock absorber. When we moved from Florida back to the north, we rediscovered something called potholes. Uh, I'd forgotten about those. We used to have a lot of them in upstate New York. And uh, so, you know, your shock absorber helps you with those. But shock absorber is kind of a negative term because really the shock absorber, maybe 1% of the time, that's what it's for. Most of the time, it's a stabilizer. It stabilizes you in the ride of life. And counseling is like that and uh, a vital part of many people's experience. Well, I want to get right into the Word today. I'm excited about what God has put on my heart. I believe He's put something on my heart specifically for us this morning. And I'm going to read a passage a little bit longer than I would usually read, but it's because I want you to catch this story. And it's in 1 Kings 17, one of my favorite stories. Now, Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself in the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. First Kings 17. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Kareth that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And then, at that moment, the word of the Lord came to him again. Arise, go to Zarephath, which, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose, went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me also a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, Listen to what she said, this widow. As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Can you imagine the depression that she felt? And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as I've said, but first make me a little cake. You notice it's gone from a morsel now to a cake. Make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. But then there's a little bit more. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. We're very aware of illnesses related to breath today. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to my remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed and he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. And everybody said, amen. amen. The Word of God, the Word of God that speaks to us today, that has something for us today that is living and active. 
When I was about 12 years old, we had a, uh, a boxer dog, a big dog, like this big dog. You walked around the neighborhood, nobody would mess with you because we had Jan, this big female boxer. And we loved this dog. And wherever we went, you know, my parents would take us camping. We always brought this dog with us. So we went on a camping trip one weekend out to, you know, like a remote area, a uh, campground. And we had been there a couple of nights. We woke up on like a, I think a Saturday morning. And we were going to be heading back. And we had our dog, Jan. And we always left her right outside the camp areas. Many years ago, people felt a lot safer about that kind of thing. And we left her on a leash, you know, connected to like a solid connector outside. And left her water and food out there for her. So we got up this morning. We knew it was the day we were going to leave. We had to have our last bit of fun. We walked out. No Jan. No dog. No boxer. Boxer's gone. And we could tell that the, the harness was broken. So instead of having fun all day, you know what we did all day. We looked for that dog. That's our dog. That dog's like 10 years old. I mean, it's like part of your family. We looked for the dog. We put an all-points bulletin out, you know, for Jan, the boxer. And uh, we looked, and, you know, my dad and mom went to, like, every store, went by the campgrounds. We asked people, have you looked? Uh, and we looked all day till, like, noon, till, like, 2, till, like, 3. Now, imagine you're the dad, and you've got to take your family two hours back home to get their week going again. And it hit a point where my dad had to say, boys, I don't know that we're going to find the dog today. I just got real quiet. I, I take it some of you own dogs. This got real quiet in here. And really, Dad? Yeah, boys, I'm sorry. We're going to stay as late as we can, but I'm going to leave word all over the area. If anybody sees them, we'll let the police know and everything. Anybody sees them, then they'll give us a call. So we went home. We got home probably about 6 o'clock, and my dad was trying to cheer us up. So he did something you wouldn't normally do that quickly. He pulled some steaks out of the freezer, cooked some steaks. And we sat at the table. I remember still with my mom and dad were eating. And my brother and I had a younger brother, four years younger than me, no other siblings, were picking at that steak. We're not even, we're not hungry. We just want the phone to ring. Telephone rings. It's one of my mom's friends calling just to check on her how she's doing. So we're all disappointed. And we're picking at that food, you know, just not eating that food. And then all of a sudden the phone rings. And yes, I hear my dad tell yes. Yeah, oh, we'll be right there. And they found our dog. Can you just clap for that? Isn't that good? <laughs> we found Jan. We found Jan. So we drove two hours. We must not have gotten home till like 11 o'clock that night. We drove two hours to that campground, got that big old boxer dog. She laid on my lap and my brother's in the back. My mother packed the steak in aluminum foil. We fed it to her on the way back. <laughs> but you know why she broke her harness? Because boxers are known to have a kidney uh, weakness. And she had knocked over her water. And she couldn't find any water. So she got so thirsty that night that she desperately pulled and pulled and pulled at that harness until it broke. And then she ran who knows how far until she could find some water to quench her thirst. Thirst is one of our most primary needs. You know, Maslow's uh, laws or guidances of needs, one of the base needs is really food, air, water, shelter, clothing, warmth. And you and I need to drink every, every little while. We need it so badly that we carry these around with us. Uh, when I worked at a university, the athletes would carry the gallon jugs around with them. You know, because that's kind of like, you know, you're, you're really thirsty. And they're like, these things are too piddly, these are too small, and they cost too much. So they would buy the little 69-cent, you know, Walmart big jug of water and drink them and walk around because we thirst. Thirst is an interesting thing. Every so often, if you're not thirsty now, and probably as I talk about it, you're going to get thirsty, um, your, your throat will begin to tickle a little bit, and you'll, you'll feel like, man, I feel like I need, and it's because so much of your body is water. Do you know one of the best things you can do for your mental health is to drink water? Do you know that there are panic attacks that people deal with that, are, that experience an onset because of dehydration? That, that the best physiological step that you can take to relieve yourself of anxiety is to drink water. 
Serotonin is produced in your brain. It, it's, it's healthy. It, it balances your system. The fluids and the systems of your structure, your physiological structure, are able to function as you keep yourself hydrated. One of the most dangerous things you can do is to become dehydrated. Thirst, such a vital part of our lives, such a vital part of our experience. Now, if we look at the story again, we kind of retrace it a little. We look at Elijah. There are a few things, if you're taking notes, I'd like to mention that I think are so important in this story. One is the prophet Elijah announces a period of drought. Can you imagine a prophet going up to President Trump or five years ago, President Obama, and saying, until I give the word, there's going to be no rain in the United States. That's what Elijah did. He went up to King Ahab, until I give the word, no more rain. God has told me to prophesy to you, no more rain for this nation until I give the word. Can you even imagine? I mean, you talk about becoming public enemy number one <laughs> in that moment. He laid his life on the line obeying God. No rain until I give the word. And a matter of fact, no rain for years to come. Now, that drought was not about global warming, but it certainly was a global warning. It was a warning to this king. And why did God allow it to happen? I believe this. Sometimes the Lord will allow a physical demonstration to reveal a spiritual problem. Sometimes the Lord will use a physical demonstration to reveal a spiritual problem. He will allow there in this season, he allowed there to be a famine. Because guess what? There was already a spiritual famine. The leaders of the land were failing God, were blaspheming God, were worshiping idols, were doing things that were hideous in the mind and heart of God. And God hit a point where he said, stop, no more. And he sent a prophet to say, no more rain until I give the word. And then the next thing that happened, this is probably smart, the prophet hid <laughs> God told the prophet to hide himself. So there was a period of distancing. Could I say that? God told, I want you to go to this brook over here, the brook Kareth. Now, Elijah, it would probably be good now that you told the king no more rain. Probably be good for you to hide out for a while. So he sends him to the brook Kareth. And while he's there, can you imagine, he lays at the brook and ravens bring him food morning and night. Right on time. Uber Eats, ultimate Uber Eats, Come in morning and night, everything that he needs come in morning and night. God's providing for him in the middle of a famine. God does that. God does that. Why? Because in a famine, God always knows where the water is. In a famine, in a drought, God knows where the food is and God knows where the water is. In the struggle that we're in the middle of in America right now, God knows where the water is. <laughs> Can you say amen? In a struggle like we're in right now, God knows how to provide, and he can do it. You say, well, how does he do it? My experience has been often in ways you would have never imagined. He does it in ways you would never have imagined. Look at Elijah. He, he's, he begins to teach him. So the prophet hides a period of distancing, and then the prophet survives. The Lord keeps bringing him food and water, food and water. And then the Bible says after a while, what happened to the brook? It dried up. It dried up. Why? Because there's a famine. <laughs> because, you know, the prophet has said no more rain. So eventually it's going to affect that brook. And the brook is dried up. And now the sociological phenomenon going on is affecting the prophet. He's feeling that there's no rain. And he must have said, Lord, what do I do next? I mean, I've got to eat, I've got to drink. So, that, you know, if it had been me, I would have said, Lord, would you send me to the Saratoga Springs spring water processing plant? That's where I want, I want to set up a, an RV right outside of there. Just keep those bottles of water coming. No, the Lord sent him to an impoverished widow down to her last meal, so depressed that she was going to make the final meal. And then she said, my son and I are going to die. Have you ever felt what it feels like to not have enough? Some of you, I know my, my father-in-law, uh, knew the pangs of that depression and how that affected people and how they tended to be very careful with food and not wasting food because it was so valuable. And that was true with my dad as well. But in, in a famine, God taught Elijah 
that I always know where the water is. I know where the food is. So he sent him to this widow, and now what does he do with the widow? He says to her, would you give me something to drink and give me just a little morsel of bread? And she said, her story. My son and I, we just have enough for us for one more meal, and then we're going to die. She's so depressed that she has determined this. And she leaves for his presence, and he said, oh, why don't you make that a cake instead of a morsel of bread? And I tell you, if you do that, you'll never run out. You'll never run out. What's Elijah doing? He's teaching her what he learned. In a drought, God always knows where the water is. In a famine, God always knows where the food is. So what is he saying? He's not saying that I'm magical. He's saying God is powerful. Give, and it shall be given to you. Give, and it shall be given to you. Press down, running. Oh, God will pour into your life. So this widow does this. She gives, and it's amazing. The food comes in. Every need is met. The Bible says for several days, Elijah, the widow, and her son ate. They had all they wanted, plenty of water, plenty of oil, plenty of food, just day after day after day. But then something else happened. This is like the other part of the story. Her son got sick, and he died. Now, I wasn't seeing that coming the first time I read that story. I'm thinking once the food is provided, then let's have a party, let's have a praise service and just celebrate the goodness of God and all our needs continue to be met. But how many of you have experienced that things don't always go, even with God, the way you think they're going to go? We sort of, Lord, you've been doing this in my life and this, so now I bet you're going to do this. Not necessarily. There's a way that seems right to man and woman, but the end there of his death the ways of the Lord are higher than our ways. How much higher as far as the heavens are above the earth? So it requires trust. So the prophet survived through a period of discovery, and God showed him where the water was. And then he struggled because the woman said, oh, you know the miracle food and the water that we've been drinking? Well, guess what? My son is sick from it now, and he's, he's dead can you imagine what that must have been like for a prophet to see a miracle, and with this miracle food and miracle water, her son has died? What would you do if that was you? I think I might say, um, you might want might to call the doctor. I want to call the doctor and get some help. Might want to take him to the, the hospital or see if there's some friends or neighbors that can help in some way. But you know what Elijah did? I think he probably struggled a bit before he did it. I think he probably thought and prayed about it before he jumped and did it. But Elijah said, give me your son. Give me your son. Do you know how many times in a ministry like this one and others, there have been sons and daughters that were in terrible places in their life, dying, struggling, spiritually hurting, and the church and the leaders and the people of the church say, give me your son. Give me your daughter. But she's dead spiritually pastor. She's, he's, he's not living spiritually pastor. I don't care. Give us your, bring them here. Let them hear about what God can do. So Elijah takes him, brings him up to his room, lays him on his bed, and he says, God, please put life back into this boy. Put life back into him. And when he didn't rouse, Elijah, and this is notably an, an awkward passage to preach, but Elijah laid on top of him, almost like mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and he breathed on him three times, Father, let life come back to this boy. Father, let life come back to this boy. Father, let life come back to this boy. And suddenly he began to feel some movement, and he backed up, and he saw a miracle. Um, it's like the prodigal son. He was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. Can you imagine what it must have felt like for that prophet to take that son, and now he's alive and moving. We don't know how old he was. And to bring him to that mom and to say, here, your son's alive. And you know what she said? She said, now I know that you're a man of God and that the word that you speak is truth, is truth, because he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Can you say amen? He's, he's alive. The Son is alive. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Life, I come that you might have life and life more abundantly. The life is in God. So, so with that story, 
couple things to note. One is the prophetic word came just as God was about to confront the nation. He sent a prophet to say something, and then he confronted the nation. And not only that, but the coming physical drought would illustrate a spiritual drought in that land, a great need in that land that existed. Now, what about you and me? How does this affect you and me in our lives today? Because I believe the Word of God is living, that it has something prophetically to speak to you and me today, something in the edge of the sword of the Word of God that He wants to use to speak to our hearts. And, and one is this. Your faith will sometimes face periods of drought. Your faith will sometimes face periods of drought. Turn to someone and say, it's going to get dry sometimes. Go ahead. Turn to someone it's going to get dry sometimes. It is. You know, Tony Evans says, uh, he says, you're either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're about to go into a storm. So I would say you're either in a drought, you've come out of a drought, or there will be a period of drought. That's just real, that's real world. So instead of just pretending like that doesn't happen, we want to build a faith that can get through those times. We want you to be ready for what's coming. We want you to be ready. God wants you to be ready for what lies ahead. And none of us know how the last three, four months are going to affect the next four years. We don't. And I'm a person that believes in hope, but I also believe we need to be ready. And we need a faith that if circumstantially we go through a drier period, our faith is not going to get dry. Our faith is going to be strong. Why? Because it's grounded in the Word of God, the presence of Jesus, a relationship with Him that grows and grows and grows and grows. I want you to know your spiritual bank account is full. Your spiritual bank account is overflowing. God has all the the needs that you have met according to His riches in Christ Jesus. Well, when is it dry? You know it's dry when it feels dry. You ever felt dry? You ever got up to pray in the morning and you're like, Lord, I'm, I'm reading through the Bible, but I'm in the book of Leviticus right now. And it's like, Leviticus, did you have to put all these details without a lot of inspirational wording connected to it? Uh, how did I get through Leviticus? And, and you, you pray, and Lord, it, I'm just trying to figure this out. I'm trying to be faithful, but it feels dry. You know it's dry when your plans are drying up. Your plans are dry. You know it's dry when there's an unexpected change that comes in your life and you're having to face it and get your head around it. You know it's dry when you lose your job or when you're worried about losing your job. You know it's dry when you get difficult news about your health or one of your kids is in a crisis and you want so bad to help them. You want so bad to help them make a good decision. You know it's dry when a big decision in life is proving difficult. You know it's dry when you you studied in a degree, you graduate, and all of a sudden the jobs in that degree have dried up. And you're like, Lord, what does this mean? You know it's dry when you lose someone you love, when you lose someone you love. Jesus on the cross in a very human moment said, I thirst. I thirst. Just a very human moment. You know, we talk about the scripture, Jesus wept, and we say he was so human. But it's also true with that verse, I thirst thirst. I'm thirsty. Imagine the creator of all the water in the world who looks at people and says, I'm thirsty. And you remember, they tried to relieve that thirst a bit, and what they did really really wasn't helpful other than maybe some remediation. But in the middle of it, I thirst. I thirst. Jesus knows about your thirst. He knows what it's like to feel dry. He let himself come to the earth to experience everything that you and I have experienced. Rejection, struggle, challenges, going without food as he fasted. So that he identified with you and me in everything in life, yet without sin. So your faith will sometimes face periods of drought. But I want to tell you where your faith is strengthened. Your faith is strengthened in the secret place. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Doesn't that sound good? It's like one of those shaded areas on a very hot day. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
Can you say amen? amen. And can you just go, ha? Ah. Yeah. The verses in the scripture are like that. One of my favorite is Jesus when he said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and you will find rest for your souls. Come unto me, all you that struggle and are challenged and overwhelmed and, and not knowing what to do next, and you will find rest for your souls. The Bible says, in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore, forevermore, forevermore. You see, in a drought, God knows where the water is. In a drought, he knows right where the water is, and he wants to bless you in such a way that you not only get a supply, but you get a giving supply. Just like the widow, not only did he want to bless her, but bless her enough so she could be blessed and also bless Elijah. Why? Because the Abrahamic blessing is this. You'll not only be blessed, and I'm pretty sure everybody in America wants to be blessed. I, I think we would agree to that, right? But no, it's different. You see, the American dream is different than the Abraham dream. The Abraham dream is, is this. You will be blessed to be a blessing to the families of the nations of the earth. You will be blessed to be a blessing to the families of the nations of the earth. In other words, God wants to bless you so much if you believe him. And I'm looking at a brother here with faith on his shirt, and I like it because it's inspiring me to preach. Uh, but the Lord wants to fill you in such a way that it just overflows to the people around you so that you become a fountain of the blessing of God. So I encourage you, keep praying that you'll be blessed in your family, but add to it that you'll be a blessing, that you'll be a blessing. And that, that's how God brings an overflow. Not only sources, but resources. I want to tell you something else about faith that the Lord has shown me in, through, through some challenging things. Your faith... And if you're here, and let's say you face some challenges with your work, and maybe you're a little uncertain, and some, as I understand, things, thank God, are holding pretty steady in a lot of ways during this season. But if you're a little concerned, you say, I just don't know, you know, the, the management's acting a little weird, I just don't know. I want you to know that, that Pamela and I have experienced before being in a place where things, where you thought things were very sure vocationally, and suddenly they change. New leadership came and they changed. And it sort of rocks your world a bit. I want you to know that here's something that we've learned. Your faith is not as strong as you are. Your faith is as strong as God is. Your faith is not as strong as you are. Your faith is as strong as God is. You say, how could that be? Because you didn't create your faith. It's a gift of God. He put it within you. It's the part that he's put within you that's the miracle part that can connect to him and his will. And when you connect to him and his will, you have access to everything he is and everything he has. So your faith, you can give him a clap on for Amen. Your faith. Your faith is something you want to really pay attention to. Because the Bible says when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? Remember the, the Roman centurion that said, if you just send the word, my servant would be healed. Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Look at this guy. He's saying you can just send your word. Why? Because he had a faith that said God can do anything. Now, a lot of us believe that God can do anything, but here's Jesus' faith. Our faith is, God, I believe you can do anything. Doctrinally, I believe that. Here's Jesus' faith. God, you can do anything right here and right now. <laughs> that was Jesus. Jesus didn't say, oh, you're sick. I'll be keeping you in my prayers. I'll put you in my little prayer book. He said, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now. Let's believe. God, faith says God can do anything right here and right now. And it may be a six-year-old or seven-year-old that believes that, but I mean, when they believe it and they pray it, back up. <laughs> back up because heaven notices and things are going to happen. Your faith is not as strong as you are. It's as strong as God is in a drought. God knows where the water is. And then one more thing about your faith. Your faith is, at, and I love this, your faith is at its best when life is at its worst. Your faith is at its best when life is at, when you think back through your life, 
Weren't some of your sweetest memories with Jesus during times when life was terrible? Life was difficult. You were struggling. Why? Because you were clinging to Jesus. You weren't just contemplating the Scripture. You were craving the Scripture. You weren't just meditating on the Word of God. You were marinating in the Word of God. You were living by it, breathing by it. That's what God desires. Why? Because God wants our souls to be watered in His presence. People will ask us from time to time, uh, when people's lives crash, when they fall apart, what do you notice? Are there any common denominators? When, let's say even ministry couples, when their marriage falls apart or when there's some crisis in a family and they just, there's a compromise that occurs. Is there any common denominator? I'd say yes. The one we hear the most often is a diminishment of private time with God. So a diminishment of intimacy with God. What's intimacy with God? Well, uh, you men and women that are married here, do you remember when you first saw that other person? Remember when you first saw them? Well, that's something when I first saw them. But here's a real deal. Do you remember when they first saw you? Do you remember when your eyes met for the first time? Now, that's, that's a moment. Why? Because you acknowledge one another. That's what we do in prayer, in intimacy with God. We wait on God. We draw near to him, and we become not only aware that we can reach out to him, but that he sees us, he hears us, he's responding to us. And it does something to your heart. It does something to your brain. It does something to your life, and it reboots you to move forward with your faith set on the purposes of God. Faith, it's a substance it's something God puts within you and me for his will to be lived out and to be done. And faith is vital in navigating this season. Because in this season, no matter how dry it might get, God knows where the water is. And every morning when you get up, every morning when you get up, God knows where it is. You know, the Bible speaks a lot about water. Moses made some mistakes when it came to calling out water. Uh, we, we read about water all through the scripture over and over again. But there is, uh, there's one story that I want to share with you, and it relates to, to living water. You see, in ancient Israel, there were three types of water, cistern water. There's a cistern, and if the water kept falling fresh, the water is fresh. But if it didn't, if it didn't rain for a while, the water, water became stagnant. And then there was well water, and that was better. It wasn't always great depending on where you got it. But then there was spring water. Spring water was considered living water because it came out of a spring. And if you've ever been to a spring, you know that water is fresh. And we buy it in bottles all the time. Spring water, spring-fed, pure water. And Jesus talked about that. So that, that crazy dog that we had, Jan, the boxer, that we finally got, picked her up, fed her all that steak on the way back. Some people are like, you're cringing that we did that, but we just weren't hungry. We wanted our dog back. What you don't know about that is that my dad really believes in securing a dog when you're on a trip. So the, the leash was not just a leash. It wasn't leather that she broke. It was chain, solid, big chain link. And that dog pulled so desperately that one of those chain links, we could see where it had bit. She had pulled and pulled. She's probably about, probably about 90 pounds, pulled and pulled and pulled until that thing came open. Why do I say that? Because for some of us, to get to the water, we have to break the chain. To get to the water, the chain has got to be broken. There are so many waters, wonderful waters, that Jesus wants you and me to drink of. In his presence, healing forgiveness, joy, wounds, people that have hurt you over the years, people that have wounded you, even people maybe that are here that have experienced abuse in your life. And at the healing waters of God, there is strength, there is hope, there is life. And Jesus said in an incredible moment that he wanted you to experience that. What was that moment? Well, it was a part of one of the feasts in Israel. And there was a part of the feast where they had the water pouring ceremony. What was the water pouring ceremony? At the end of it, uh, the, the culmination of it, the priests would go out, all of the priests, dozens of them, and they would fill the containers with water. They'd fill the urns and the pots with water. And they would go to the top of the temple stairs. And at the right call, all of a sudden, they would pour the water out. 
dozens of them just pour it out, and it would come down, and it would cascade over the stairs to where the families, the men, the dads, the moms, the children were there, and in their sandaled feet, feet, the water would just wash over them. Children waited for it. It was like the fireworks of water shows, and it was beautiful. It's like better than anything they'd ever do in Las Vegas or anywhere with waterfalls. It was just a moment that people did not want to miss at the feast. Well, what you might not know is that Jesus' brothers had told him, you need to be there because it's time for you to promote yourself. You're doing these miracles. You need to showcase them. And before that, Jesus said, for you, any time is good. This is not my time. So in the middle of that, when the water was pouring at the, at the pinnacle, the Bible says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So Jesus suddenly appeared from incognito in the middle of that crowd. And as the water cascaded, he provided the narration. And he said, anyone who believes in me, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be like this temple, and the water of God is going to flow from you down the steps of your life into the neighborhoods that you live in, into your communities. I'm going to bring healing. I'm going to bring life. I'm going to bring love. I'm going to bring grace and faith in powerful ways. If you believe in me, out of your innermost being, the King James Version says, out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. We've experienced some dry times in this country in recent weeks, confusing times. And as I said earlier, none of us has it all figured out. But what we do know is that when droughts come, Jesus knows right where the water is. And you know what he would say today if he were standing up here? He'd say, it's right, right there. It's right there. It's inside of you. It's the Spirit of God. If you let the Spirit of God be released in you, Everything you need, everything your family needs, everything your life needs, every hurt can be healed. Every need can be provided. Every crooked path can be made straight. If you just believe in me, if you believe in me, Jesus said, you will become my temple and out of you will flow beautiful, glorious, cascading rivers of the glory and the grace and the goodness of God. Don't you, moms and dads, don't you want that for your children? Young men and women, don't you want that for your life? What the world needs today, we can't conjure up. What we need to do, we can't conjure up. Somebody asked me a few months ago, would you write an article on leading through a pandemic? I said, listen, I'm trying to figure out how to lead through a pandemic. I said, I need to read that article, you know? So so with us, we need God so desperately. And he's there. He's there. Would you stand to your feet, bow your head with me? I want to pray for you. Some of you are here today, and you say, you know, I feel in my heart that there's there's this hope that's rising within you so desperately. Would you come and cleanse me? Remove my sin. Break the chains. Help me to run to the fountain. And Lord, out of my innermost being, let rivers of life come rivers of joy, rivers of peace, rivers of rest, rivers of life that will fuel my life and my family for the purposes of God. In the strong name of Jesus, and everybody said, let's worship the Lord out of your innermost being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.